Welcome everyone to our Thursday webinar. I am just going to wait a few minutes to make sure that everyone is able to get connected, has their sound on. My name is Lourdes. I'm a patient advocate with the Clandrew Carcinoma Foundation. And I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Ruth He. She is a GI medical oncologist working at Lombardi Comprehensive Cancer, Georgetown University Hospital in Washington, DC. Her research interests are on hepatobiliary cancer. She is a clinical investigator of many clinical trials evaluating new therapeutics for liver cancer. Thank you, Dr. Heath, for being here with us today. Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Ruth He, and I want to thank the Colangio Carcinoma Foundation to invite me to talk about use of the immunotherapy in the first line treatment of cholangial carcinoma, and also introduce you to the Turmalin trial, uh, which is a new frontline trial for patients with cholangial carcinoma. So here is my disclosure. I do receive research funding from company to do uh, studies. And here is the contents I'm going to cover. So I want to uh, provide the rationale for immunotherapy for BTC. I'm going to do a brief review of the Topaz-1 study and Kino 966 key clinical findings. And I want to show you a landmark analysis um, why we are using median over survival or landmark analysis to look at the immunotherapy trials. I want to show you some of the data on the TAP score, which is uh, to, we try to develop immune biomarkers. And um, I also want to show you why we start immunotherapy at the very beginning together with chemotherapy. I want to provide you some safety data on the Viomap Pembrolizumab and, and also uh, bridging to unmet needs in real world practice and, and then introduce you to the uh, Tumanen study. So you probably are very familiar with this slide, and this uh, tell this shows us the challenge on how to manage patients with advanced cholangiocarcinoma, and the workup can be very prolonged. And um, uh, I think a, based on a study done supported by Cholangiocarcinoma Foundation, and even among patient. Who, had, uh, who are able to have a curative resection, a big portion of the patients would, will have recurrence. And patients sometimes can present with cancer of unknown primary and then are found to be cholangial carcinoma, which tells us the challenge of making a diagnosis. So um, about 80% of the patients were diagnosed with advanced stage disease. And currently, the five-year survival is still dismal, and which stressed the importance of clinical research and clinical trial um, in this uh, in this disease uh, type. So um, it has been ten years. Finally, we have had some uh, positive phase three studies. So 2010, that's when we had our last uh, positive phase three study, which established the use of gemcitabine cisplatin as the standard of care. It has been 10 years until we have the positive Topaz-1, which is the first study uh, established the role of immunotherapy in the frontline treatment of cholangiocarcinoma. Um, this year, uh, we also have the Keynote 966 study, red positive, that has supported the use of pembrolizumab plus gemcis in the frontline treatment. So uh, a little bit of mechanism of action. So when uh, in cancer, we know when there is an increased expression of this PD-L1, PD-1 in tumor cells or immune cells, and the PD-1, PD-L1 interaction will uh, inhibit the T cell activation and suppress the immune attack to the tumor. So uh, the Viomap or Pembrolizumab will interfere the interaction between PD-1 and PD-L1 and block the interaction to activate the T cells and provoke the, the, your immunity to fight the cancer. 
and um, so uh, this uh, the this is the initial phase two study, which showed very promising results that showing the value map plus gemsys um, that have shown the promising results in biliary tract cancer. This was a phase two study uh, carried out in Korea and initially had a very high response rate. And you can see the waterfall curve, a lot of responders. And this data has encouraged the design of this global phase three study, Topaz one study. And this is a study enrolled about uh, close to 700 patients. I'm sorry, my nurse is calling. I have to mute myself. I'm very sorry. I had a patient who had a biopsy. The nurse is calling and, you know, nurse, nurses call take priority of everything. Um, so this is a study patient randomized to uh, the value map plus gem, gemsys versus gemsys. And patients get six months of gemsys and then continue the value map or placebo. The primary endpoint was over survival. Sorry, I have to. Okay, here is the survival curve. So you can see the survival curve separate. The purple one is combination of the value map plus gemsys. And if you look at the median over survival, there's an improvement with a hazard ratio of 0.76. And if you look at the survival rate at two years, and the survival doubled uh, with in patients receiving the value map plus gemsys compared to gemsys alone. And the data has support uh, the, the, the FDA approval of the value map plus gemsys. Now let's talk about survival curve. And I will do this quickly. So we look at uh, we, uh, when immunotherapy are developed to treat cancer, and we found and it takes um, weeks to months to, for, for, to build up an anti-tumor response by immunotherapy. And usually the, those we can see a raised tail of the curve suggesting durable response. And so we're quite excited about this finding. And, and then if you look at, I'm giving you another example. If you look at the median over survival versus landmark uh, survival over survival. So when immunotherapy, uh, we start to see the behavior of effectiveness of immunotherapy in cancer treatment, we start to use more landmark analysis because um, sometimes we will see the, the tail of the curve increases and the landmark over survival analysis will reflect that better and tell us what's happening more than the median over survival. And so giving you another example, on the left side is the immunotherapy a treatment. Usually you see the race of the tail of the curve. And if you look at the chemotherapy, sometimes chemotherapy can result in initial response, but the response is not very durable. And then when you look at the, the landmark analysis and you don't, you see you lost the benefit of the survival. Of course, the, sometimes, Sometimes the chemotherapy, you were able to see an uh, improved uh, uh, median over survival. So I believe both in, uh, median over survival and landmark survival rate are both important to reflect the benefit of therapy. So, um, so here, uh, so I just showed you the curve. And now, and this is the subgroup analysis of Topaz study. And what we're trying to say to, to see is if we want to identify a group of patients who benefit more or less to this regimen. So this is how you look at the curve, the, the figure is you look at one, which is the straight line here. And anything four on the left side show benefit, any four fa favor the combination of the value map plus gemsys, anything four on the right side favor the placebo plus gemsys. So you can see uh, all the subgroup uh, of patients in different category that you all have shown benefit favor the value map plus uh, gemsys. Uh, the TAP score. So if you follow the data on immunotherapy and PDL1 staining uh, has been evaluated as a biomarker in lung cancer and gastric cancer. And usually we use combined positive CPS score, which you, you add the PDL1 stain, uh, stain positive cells tumor cells and immune cells in the immune microenvironment. And you should try to use that to uh, uh, as a biomarker. 
But in the Topaz one study, we use TAP score because it is difficult to count numerically all the cells. And the TAP score basically use a visual based methods to calculate how much cells, how many cells are test positive for PDL1 staining. So Topaz one study trying to study if PDL1 is a biomarker to select patient in and out for this regimen. And you can see, um, despite of the cutoff, all patients fall on the left side of this, this line, suggest currently we don't use TAP score or CPS score to select patients in this disease. And so then patient ask, well, your survival curve separate at six months, is it beneficial to, to start immunotherapy upfront with chemotherapy? So now I wanna show some, uh, some data to you to suggest, yes, we should start immunotherapy upfront together with chemotherapy. This is supported by, you can see six months pro progression-free survival. If you just do chemo plus placebo was 47%, but if you do the three drug combination, immunotherapy plus chemo, it's 58%. So suggesting immunotherapy plus chemotherapy upfront provides some benefit. An another evidence I wanna show you is the response rate. So numerically, if you start the, the, the sorry, numerically, uh, the response rate is higher if you combine immunotherapy plus gemsys com uh, in comparison with gemsys alone. The other thing is time to response. And you can see the time patient respond earlier if you do the three drug combination compared to is right here at the bottom. And in comparison to patients receiving just the gemsys. So toxicities, um, people always concern if you add more agent to the combination, do you add more toxicities? As an oncologist, we usually look at any grade three, four treatment related AE and or any treatment related adverse events leading to the treatment discontinuation. So you can see the, uh, the red line here really add um, a, the value map to gemsys compared to gemsys along numerically you really uh, don't see a added more toxicities of course if you look at the immune mediate toxicities the number the the number is higher because you add the immune therapy drug to it so the now i will quickly cover the keynote 966 and uh, the this is the data support the the combination of pembrolizumab plus gemsys and uh, over gemsys alone. And this uh, has led to the FDA approval. And um, I think just a few weeks ago. And this is the survival curve. And the hazard ratio is 0.83. And you see this, you see the two curves separate. And again, they also did the subgroup analysis and you see all subgroup four on the left side of the line, suggesting currently we don't use any of this subgroup to select patient in and out for treatment. So all patients uh, with upfront um, uh, newly diagnosed cholangiocarcinoma, we should consider immunotherapy plus chemo if they don't have any contraindication. And you can see there's also um, some in, in, uh, in improvement um, in uh, with the combination. And um, the over survival uh, rate is very similar. The duration of response rate numerically is a, a, is a little better. And if you look at, it's also very well tolerated. If you compare at grade three, four uh, toxicities, uh, ver uh, pembrolizumab plus gemsys versus placebo plus gemsys are very similar. If you look at um, uh, lead to discontinuation of treatment is also very similar. So immunotherapy plus gemsys is quite well tolerated, should be considered as the frontline therapy. So this slide shows the immune-mediate uh, adverse events of pembrolizumab plus gemsys. Um, and you can see in general, it's quite well tolerated. So uh, now we have two FDA-approved immunotherapy, devayomab, pembrolizumab, in combination with gemsys in the frontline treatment of BTC. So real world patient, you know, when we screen patient for a, any randomized clinical trial, there are very strict inclusion criteria for, uh, for, uh, for uh, 
to get patient on study. So there are, which will leave a lot of patient out who do not fit in, fit the inclusion criteria. So now if you look at the real world population, so um, what if patient is not a candidate for cisplatinin treatment? So cisplatinin is a very, uh, very old chemo and it has um, many side effects. And although now we've learned a, how to manage this, but in patients with underlying kidney disease and or kidney uh, dysfunction, and we try to avoid this, uh, the drug. And or if patients with decreased performance status, all those trial required patient has a performance zero or one. Yeah, what about if patients with performance of two? Uh, how about the ampullary cancer? So ampular, ampular is the exit well, the pancreatic duct and bio duct all joint to uh, to the to the small to the duodenum to dump to the pancreas juice and bio uh, into uh, in into the bowel. Um, so um, ampullary cancer usually is has been excluded for from this study, and so patients um, because it's a real problem, and we we would um, because it is a real disease. And so what about how, how to treat those patients? How about if patients in the trial, usually we will say patient had surgery, if they've not had progression uh, more than six months, then they can enroll in the study. How about if patients have progressed or recurred at five months after surgery? So those patients and uh, currently they, they, they were excluded from the, all those two randomized trials. So now, that's why we designed this phase 3B, single arm open label multi-center study, basically to test the value map in combination with chemo. Those are gemcitabine based chemo for the first line treatment of, uh, uh, treatment of patients with advanced biliary tract cancer. So that's, this is the study and this is the clinical trial. I'm so sorry, I have to. Okay, it's okay. So this is the clinical trial number and you can find at the clinicaltrial.gov. So um, now I'm gonna provi provide you rationale why we designed this study. So if you look at, um, so this is an interesting uh, survey data. And so you can see there's US, European, China, and Japan, and the blue bar of percent of patients using GEMSYS. Okay. Um, and there's no possibility, uh, so, there, so those patients get, um, uh, all those patients get cisplatin and gemcitabine as a frontline therapy. But you can see in the US, only 46% of patients receive that. And some of those patients are not able to tolerate GEMSYS or they are not candidate for GEMSYS. And, uh, and then um, in Europe, 46%, in Japan, 60%, in China, only 21%. But GEMSYS is still the predominant chemo combination regimen uh, for, uh, the, it's still the predominant uh, chemo therapy regimen for patients. And then followed by other gem-based regimen, which is the, the, this clear gray bar, and then followed by gemcitabine alone, followed by uh, other combinations. So um, an S1 is a oral agent that has been used quite a bit in, um, in, uh, in Asia, and which uh, it's, I think it's this, uh, this colored bar, and it has made it into the guideline. And so you can see, um, we would need to have more data to evaluate uh, the value map in combination with other uh, gemcitabine-based re recipe. And if you look at the NCCN guideline, so NCCN guideline is a is national comprehensive cancer network. And so it get updated every quarter and most practice physician actually go to NCCN guideline and try to review the guideline. So it is followed quite by a lot of uh, physicians. And so you can see alternative regimen. So people have thought about in patients who cannot be a candidate for GEMSYS, what kind of regimen they would, um, 
uh, they, 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 they could use. So those who are recommended. So now I'm going to show you the data, historic data. So usually those are supported by phase two, some of phase three uh, trials. Uh, the, the number of uh, patients enrolled in those trials are still relatively small, but those are effective regimen. So if you look at the gem or gem cytopene oxaliplatin in this phase two study, 22% response rate, median over survival 12 months. And there are some data support gem cytopene carboplatin and gem cytopene S1. And so those are the alternative regimen that people use in patients who cannot receive gem, uh, gem cytopene cisplatin combination. And what, what about a gem, um, so on the other uh, uh, on the other side, so we have patients who are robust, robust young, and we want to they want un, unresectable upfront, but we we think there's a chance for them to have a resection if we can shrink the tumor significantly. So that's why triplets are developed to really try to boost the response rate, shrink the tumor. Hopefully, will bridge patient to surgery. So for example, GEMSYS plus S1 and has shown a response rate as high as 41%. This is an Asian study. And, and also gem cytopene cisplatin plus NAP paclitaxel. And this was a phase two study showed a 45% response rate. And um, so it, it may not be good for everyone, but it would be good to have data on if we want to do the triplet combination, uh, do we have good safety data and add to add the, the immunotherapy? So um, study rationale. So um, so I, I said, we need to have alternative chemo regimen. We need to find an option for patients with performance status too. We also need to find data on to support use of the, 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 the treatment in ampullary cancer, which currently are excluded from the study from the topaz study or the keynote study and or how about uh if they've had surgery they recurred quickly what to do with them so we that that's the rationale to design the the this uh, this study so the other thing we want to know is we want to shorten the time of treatment for convenience for con convenience of the patient so in this study, we also will test the shorter duration of the value map. So cycle one patient will get an infusion in one hour and follow up, uh, follow up um, cycles will be all 30 minutes. And so this will hopefully will shorten the time of infusion. And so I'm going to cover briefly the in, in, some uh, highlight the inclusion criteria um, and you can see this uh, phase one, 3B study have broadened the inclusion criteria to allow more patients to get on to, uh, so we can get additional data and uh, on um, those patients. So for example, patient has an HBV infection, what to do, we would want to have patient to be on HBV treatment before they can start. And other inclusion criteria now in this study we not only include uh, intrahepatic cholangio extrahepatic cholangio gallbladder cancer and we will include ampullary cancer and and so um, we will allow um, patient po uh, post surgery recurrence regardless of the time to recurrence um, we also allow patients who had residual disease after surgery, even they have received chemo, chemo radiation, they <clears throat> will still be allowed to get on this study. And we allow patients with uh, a performance status of two get on the study. Of course, like all studies, we'll, immunotherapy is contraindicated in pregnant women, so <clears throat> all patients need to get a negative pregnancy test. Some just highlights of the exclusion criteria. I did not include all the exclusion criteria, but I found some of this are important point out is patient with brain meds, if they are treated properly, they are allowed in the US. Still, we would not take patients with co-infection of HBV, HCV co-infection. And so if patient has another primary malignancy, if they are early stage and risk of recurrent, uh, or they've not recurred for five years and they can, uh, they are allowed to 
uh, to be enrolled. Of course, patients with other, um, I think, leptomeningeal carcinomatosis and are not allowed. I think a lot of those inclusion uh, exclusion criteria are similar to other trials. So currently, the study is open in, um, in many sites all over, all over the world. Currently, there are five sites um, uh, in the US and one is actively open. The other four sites are about to open. Here is the clinical, uh, trial, uh, the, the clinical trial number you can find on clinicaltrial.gov to identify the sites where the study could open. And the study is open um, in Europe and in Asia. So hopefully we'll collect a lot of data and um, on this. So conclusion. So the value map, pembrolizumab, is indicated, uh, the value map or pembrolizumab is indicated in combination with GEMSYS as treatment in adult with advanced um, biliary tract cancer. The combination has been FDA approved, by, uh, has been FDA approved, recommended by NCCN guideline. A Tormanen study is a phase 3b study that tests the combination of the value map plus mainly gemcitabine based regimen in bile duct cancer and um, um, ampullary cancer with a broader inclusion criteria that reflect the real world patient population. And so I've made this relatively short so I can open for questions um, if um, Re regarding the or the material I presented or any other questions regarding cholangiocarcinoma. Thank you, Dr. He. If anyone has any questions, please put them in the Q&A or in the chat. Um, we do have a few that came in while you were speaking. Is there any negative or positive correlation between the presence of FGFR and response to immunotherapies? Just one second. Uh, let me just stop sharing. Um, so, um, so the question, uh, so can you ask the question again? It was sure. Is there any the negative or positive correlation between the presence of FGFR and the response to immunotherapies? So, uh, patients with FGFR fusion tend to have a better prognosis. So currently we do not really have, we have not teased out if there was any, in, um, if there is any positive or negative in, impact of immunotherapy on those patients. So if you look at, um, uh, so there was an abstract presented by Dr. O, I think in one of the ESMO meeting. And uh, in that study, we took all the Topaz patients and look at the genetic alteration. We tried to figure out um, which group would uh, do better um, on immune combination versus uh, chemo along, and we've um, the data set is uh, the, the number of patients are very small. We couldn't really make any conclusion out of it, but in general, patients with FGF for fusion uh, has better prognosis and in terms of survival. Okay, um, if someone had only gems, um, gemsis like years ago, do you? In your opinion, can they go go back to get with uh, to have dervalumab? So, um, patient had gemcitabine years ago for what for adjuvant treatment or the, for? Um, okay, I'm going to um, say for yes. <laughs> yeah, patient who have received uh, gemcitabine for adjuvant setting years ago should still be a candidate. Uh, for the gemcitabine uh, devalumab uh, gemsys, or um, on the study would be uh, any gem-based regimen. Okay. Um, are the effects of chemotherapy exacerbated by the immunotherapy? Um, it's interesting. And I remember when the Topaz study, uh, when we, uh, so I, I, I was an investigator on the Topaz one study, and when we look at all the safety data, and we found out actually, um, if you look at the number just numerically, there's no more uh, increased toxicity numerically, and patients se seems to do a little better. So I would say um, it's um, the 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 toxicity. It's not 
of uh, it's there's no more toxicity uh, if you do the combination the Viomap plus Gemsys. If you look at all the number numerically, of course, if you want to look at just the immune mediate toxicities. Um, there's more in the Devimab plus Gemsys, but the, usually those quite low grade and very well managed. Devimab is just quite well tolerated in a lot of patients. Okay. Um, what is the rate of recurrence on Devimab only? Is the recurrence mainly local or expressed by metastasis? Um, so currently, um, Devimab is uh, used for the, so what you're trying to ask is the devalumab, effect on devalumab uh, is more, it's better in the primary tumor or the metastasis? Is that what, what the question is? I think the question is more on whether if devalumab is used, um, what the rate of recurrence may be, and if it's seen more in terms of like a metastasis or if it's a local recurrence that is seen. I see. So currently, uh, Dovayumab is tested in patients with advanced stage disease. So either patient have had surgery recurred, or if they are diagnosed with advanced unresectable cancer. So currently, we have those data. And interestingly, and we are trying to test this in the adjuvant setting. And but that's still a study being planned. It's not open yet. Usually when we have any new therapy, we want to test in a disease. Usually we go to the patients with advanced stage disease. When we see a good results, then we try to test to see if this treatment would provide benefit or to lower the risk of recurrence. Okay. Have I answered the question? think so. If not, I'm sure she can put an additional follow up in the Q and A. Um, yeah. What is the maximum number of infusions that one can take, and what is the indicators to stop immunotherapy? Yeah, um, that's a very that's a very good question. So, um, so first, I want to tell you what we did in the Topaz one study. And and then and then I can talk about um, other stuff. So to, in Topaz one study, patient uh, allowed to continue gemsys for six months, and then continue immunotherapy until toxicity or who cannot tolerate. And so uh, we have patients who do really really well. And um, the question is, if they have a very good response to immunotherapy, how long? should they be on? And we have this question asked for the melanoma folks and the HCC folks more, because uh, patients with, uh, we, we see a lot of more patients um, and those have been tested for longer time. And so now people are, doing, are trying to do research. Should we do one year, two years? And uh, so we ask that question, but I don't think we have that uh, we have that question answered for cholangiocarcinoma. And so uh, usually you, we have a stop date for the adjuvant treatment. For example, if we will, uh, after surgery, if we do a trial, we probably would stop at a year. But for advanced stage disease, I don't think we have those number. Um, which specific checkpoint blockage immunotherapy, anti pd one or PD-1, or CTLA-4, along with chemo, has the best response? Could you ask the question again? I'm sorry. My <laughs> Which nurse paged me again, like text me. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> Which specific yeah. checkpoint blockage, immunotherapy, anti pd one or PD-1 or CTLA-4, along with chemo, has the best response? Okay, um, so uh, that's also very good. I wonder if this patient have read all these papers. <laughs> um, so um, there are some data in Korea on um, testing um, uh, the combination of CTLA-4 and like map plus the map in combination with chemo and in cholangiocarcinoma. And so, so far, I think, um, uh, we, we don't really have large uh, study 
testing the comp the, the the two draw combination in um in combination with chemo as a global study so we don't have a clear answer and but as far as we can tell ct uh, we currently i don't think we have any data to really tell anti pdl1 anti pd1 which one is better i don't think we have those data and you can see uh when you I don't think we're supposed to compare Topaz-1 and Kino-966 head to head because they're different study. And um, so in terms of CTLA-4, we know anti-CTLA-4 treatment has effective, has um, activity in cholangiocarcinoma. That I can say for sure. And so currently um, the field is moving very quickly. So anti-CTLA-4, in combination with PD, anti PD one or anti PDL one, and um, I think um, has shown benefit uh, over anti PD one, anti PDL one in many cancer type. And the reason that we have not pushed it forward quickly is because now we have new technology. We have like bi specific. We have the two headed antibody. One hits one immune checkpoint. One hits another immune checkpoint. And we're testing those, and some of those have better safety profile. So this is currently a very active field. And I, I do think it's, um, if patient, it's a good time for patient try to ask for clinical trials. If there is a clinical trial and uh, available and really talk with the oncologist, try to get along because there, there's a huge, um, so the advancement in science on how to use immunotherapy in cancer in general. I think hepatobiliary cancer, liver, bile duct cancer, we're still, we're not at the forefront. And melanoma and kidney cancer, actually they're moving a little faster, lung cancer moving a little faster than we are. So, but we can see a lot of new um, immunotherapy, innovative immunotherapy combination are being tested. Some of those are moving to cholangiocarcinoma. And, and right now there's a very exciting one in the adjuvant setting, but I don't think it's open for enrollment yet. So you can see, I don't have a clear answer for you, but I know anti-CTLA-4 is e effective. We don't, we don't have data to say anti-PD-1 or anti pd one which one is better. And we have new therapy coming out that we i believe will be probably more effective and also have better safety profile thank you um so the tourmaline trial attempts to capture all patients that would not have previously qualified for incumbent immunotherapy is that correct we trying i think we we're, we're trying to do that uh so uh i think we at least this will capture a huge portion of those patients and uh, so the purpose of this trial is really uh, uh, so the primary endpoint is safety just to make sure it is safe to do the combination of course on the side secondary endpoint we're collecting response rate safety data we're going to response rate survival progression free survival Duration of response will collect a lot of efficacy data point. And hopefully when we finish that this trial, we'll be able to um, patients who are not candidate for GEMSYS or who would, would not have been candidate for those trials will, be, will have access or the physicians will feel more comfortable to use the, the Viomab immunotherapy plus other regimen. Now that there are two preferred regimens, Dervalumab and Gemsys and Pembrolizumab and Gemsys, how do you decide which regimen to put a patient on? That's also a tricky question. I would think, um, so Topaz-1 study came out a little more than a year, uh, uh, more than a year ahead of the Kino-966. So the Kino-966, the data is still maturing. And, um, but, uh, so the Topaz-1 study, I think we have a little more data. We have follow, uh, I think the uh, longer follow-up data has also been out presented and which we see actually the hazard ratio for over survival have improved over time. So I think for, um, I, uh, I would, uh, I think I currently, I have been using the value map 
a lot more in combination with GEMSYS. And Pembro plus GEMSYS, the data, the, it met its primary endpoint. And we also, we hope to see more data, follow-up data will be presented in many conferences. But it's available, now it's on the NCCN guideline. It is approved a few weeks ago. Okay. Um, when you say a good response, what are you measuring? So uh, a good response, um, it's a complex idea. So uh, when an oncologist say a good response means if patient meet the criteria for a partial response or a complete response. So partial response is more than 30% tumor shrinkage, and that counts as a partial response. So when I talk about uh, like early on with the triplet, 45% response rate means 45% of patients have significant tumor shrinkage, 30% or more tumor shrinkage. And that becomes very significant if, um, if you, your patient has borderline resectable disease, you really rely on the tumor shrinkage, maybe we'll get patient to resection. So, uh, but if you, we look at all patients, I, if I broaden the good response, the concept of good response a little more, patients with minor tumor shrinkage or stable disease for a long time, and that I would also consider a good response. Um, is there any correlation of immunotherapy response in younger or older th patients? That is also a trick question. I think we are trying to look at that in the Topaz one data, and but now when you, it was six hundred eighty patients. We you try to um, adjust for all the prognostic factors, and then you divide the patients up then it becomes very difficult to make a lot of, like uh, make a lot, um, I think it's hard to, uh, to really say for sure. Uh, so I don't think we have enough data for me to say, uh, which is um, uh, younger patients do better versus the older patients do better. I'm, I just don't, we don't have that data. But I think that's a very interesting, um, that's a very interesting question because I think uh, now uh, there are a lot we see cancer develop at a younger age in many type of cancer, and so especially in colon cancer, and it's like moving really to younger patients. But for hepatobiliary cancer, we have not seen that large trend yet. Um, do you have a feeling that treatment with GEM and ivocidinib would be more effective than ivocidinib alone? I will say, uh, oh, um, I cannot say. Uh, um, so um, for IDH1 mutated um, disease, and you can see uh, this is, um, we currently don't have any data, but um, have I treated uh, patients, I have a lot, quite many patients with IDH1 mutation, and currently, we're still doing gem system IMAP upfront, and uh, lacking the using the avocitinib in com in the frontline combination, and um, and then if they progress, then we transition to avocitinib. Currently, I don't think we have any clear data to show adding the chemo to it provide benefit versus causes risk. We don't have that data. Okay. Um. In your opinion, what's the best decision to be made if immunotherapy was effective, but the side effects kick in, probably get more, more side effects? Should the patient continue with the immunotherapy and control um, or endure the side effects or stop it? I see. So um, do no harm is the doctor's quote. And so usually we um, patients develop side effects if it's immune mediated side effects. So then we grade them. And if they're low grade, then we try to sort of continue treatment and manage with top, topical creams or with treatment that uh, hopefully will not affect patients quality of life that much. But if the side effects is persistent grade two, so we actually have a table 
every in um, we have that in our head too if patients side effects is grade three so for example diarrhea if they have more more than seven bowel movements but it, that quotes like great like grade three diarrhea but it, four to seven times and that's grade two but you can see if patient has a persistent grade two that's very difficult on patients quality of life so we always talk with the patients we don't want to really have we don't have we don't want the treatment have a major impact on patients quality of life but we would want to manage it and the question about steroids and a lot of these side effects can be managed if we intervene early and um but we believe we believe high dose steroids um, um, there are some trials suggest if you use high dose steroids together with immunotherapy, the effectiveness of immunotherapy start to decline. So it doesn't make a lot of sense to put patient on high dose steroids and give the immunotherapy. And um, the, the, the reason I'm saying that is there was a trial in melanoma. People, we give patient prophylactic steroids treatment. And then we try to look at the efficacy of immunotherapy in those patients, and we found the efficacy decreases. So high dose immunotherapy by itself it will, will, will decrease the efficacy. So it's a balance. We want first good efficacy, decreased toxicity, and not, not no negative impact on patients' quality of life. So then it's between you and your oncologist and try to weigh that and make a decision when to stop. Um, if a patient uses Gemsys Derba, would this disqualify them from participating in Gemsys Keytruda combination or other immunotherapy options? Uh, it will disqualify. Um, if your first line of therapy was Gemsys, can you have Gemsys and Dervalimab as a third or fourth line of therapy? Um, I've had exactly the, the same situation. So uh, this usually happens uh, in pay, uh, while w the Devalumab was about to be FDA approved. So you can see we have a lot of patients started on, on Gemsys and have not progressed what to do. Then we just add the Devalumab back. We, there's no data on if they progressed on the uh, Gemsys if adding the value map, how effective would that be? We just don't have any data. But I think if patients is having mild disease progression and not symptomatic, and um, you're just trying to, it's just measurement difference, then it makes sense clinically to add it back and see if patient will stabilize, have a stabilized disease or have response to the treatment. But if patient is having rapid disease progression, then in this case, probably switching to a second line chemo regimen would be a better idea. Just this is from the clinical judgment. Okay. Um, could your value map be added to gemcitabine alone for better response if they've already had a gemcis combination treatment? So if patient had a gemcitabine cisplatinine combination, now they progressed. They did have and our Mm -hmm. They progress, um, but now we're only on gemcitabine. Could gervalimab be added to gemcitabine alone? I see. Um, that's also um, uncharted ground, and so um, uh, so in um, in this case, um, if we just don't have the data, um, and also gemcitabine plus. The value map, and you would think that would be safe, and it is one of the arm we're going to test in this uh, phase three B study. Okay. Um, is Gemsys plus CPI treatment is one infusion sufficient? Is there any evidence? Okay. Uh, Gem. Uh, sorry. I'm... Gemsys plus CPI treatment. Oh, um, uh, is this on this list of questions? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, CPI. Oh, um, okay. So that's a that uh, that's a clinical trial, and um, was 
plus it's one infusion once ah i see um so uh we um okay uh people immunotherapy work very differently um for example some immunotherapy you only need to give one dose other immunotherapy you have to give continuously and so um uh i i think if uh if the doctor recommend only one dose there are two explanations one is one one dose has shown positive data in those pa patients second is repeat repeating those may cause more toxicities so that's that that's the two reasons i can think of why the doctors only recommended one dose okay perfect thank you have you seen hyper progression as a result of immunotherapies i have not seen in uh liver cancer uh, I see a lot of patients, so HCC and cholangeal. I know this is, has been described in other cancer, but I have not personally seen. Okay. Um, do you happen to know if what can potentially cause um, swelling and water retention it, among the three different types of um, treatments, so Derva, Gem? gemcitabine or cisplatin, do you think that any of those would contribute to higher water retention and swelling? Uh, usually, I think, um, so let's talk about the, the side effects a little bit. Uh, I don't think it's from the value map. And gemcitabine um, can uh, cause um, swelling and rash in the lower extremity and behave like cellulitis kind of picture. So that's a known side effects of gemcitabine. And cisplatin has, um, has a lot of impact on the kidney. So uh, also when we give patients cisplatin, we give a lot of pre and post hydration to protect the kidney. Because if patient is dehydrated, the kidney can be in negatively impacted by cisplatin. So when patients are giving two liters of flu uh, normal saline, at the cisplatin infusion, if they they have on some underlying kidney problem, they can have fluid retention. So you can see. Uh, so this needs to be looked at by the medical oncologist and see which could have contributed and what can be used. If this is a cellulitis, swelling, rash kind of gemcitabine side effects, then there's different management. But I suspect this is more like. There's some underlying kidney issue, and there's a lot of hydration to protect the kidney, and patients start to retain fluids. Okay. Uh, can dervalumab be added with oxaliplatin after gemsis, and dervalumab has been taken? So uh, that uh, currently we don't have any data, and for this terminal trial, is this is testing patient who have never received any, um, uh, who have not received any uh, uh, treatment, frontline tr treatment. Um, um, but, um, so this, this allow patients, if they have received GEMSYS in the adjuvant setting, and if then they enroll on the terminal study, they can get the value map plus GEMMOX and uh, as part of the trial. But if they've had the Viomab, GEMSYS, I don't think they'll candidate. And also you would question, continual immunotherapy would, uh, would that provide a did, uh, added benefit? Okay. Um, I think that's everyone's questions. Thank you so much for your time, Dr. He. Perfect. Yes, thank you so much. Thanks for having me to uh, and also sorry for the interruption by my nurse, but uh, it, it, it's, it's fun to talk about uh, the trial, the data. I hope the information will be uh, will provide some benefit to uh, to the audience. Definitely. Thank you again. It was really informative. I appreciate it. <laughs> thank you. Bye, everyone.